Okay, so in this section, this video, we're going to talk about section 1.5 and everything that that involves. Um, functions and graphs is still our chapter. We're now talking about exponential functions. So these are different ones, but there's going to be a lot of similarities to what we've already been doing, and some of the techniques are going to be the same in what we have to do. So kind of look at what we have here. All right. So... We're going to talk about these exponential functions, and bottom line, what it is, is it's a function where the variable is going to be in the exponent. It's going to be in the power, all right? And there's a lot of good applications, and you'll see a couple here. Compound interest involving finances, population growth, radioactive decay, and some other things here. So look at the two here, the, these functions. For example, the one on the right, g of x equals x squared, it has an exponent, but the variable is the base. It's the, this 2 that's being, that's the power. Okay, so that's normal. That's what we've been dealing with. You see the one here on the left, this is the exponential. And again, the main key is the variable, the x, it's up in the power. That's what we're talking about right there. So Kind of what these other slides are talking about. And you're going to see, I'm going to go through not every one of these slides. I'm going to skip through a handful of them. Um, you're always more than welcome to go look up the slides in your video resources if you want to look at this PowerPoint a little more in depth or see some other pieces. But I'm mainly just going to give you the introduction and then we're going to get to some problems here because that's really what is the importance. So again, the two of them, where the variable is, what is what matters. So in your exponential function, the base matters, but it's where the exponent is and what else is going on that's really going to make a difference. Some of the keys is the base needs to be a positive number, and it can't be equal to 1. Because if the base is 1, it doesn't matter what the power is. You're always going to have a 1. All right, important ones. The domains all real numbers. Like most of the ones we have, there's no square root. There's no fraction. Therefore, we're going to get all real numbers. Everything can be plugged in there. The range is going to be all positives, and that's important because we only get positive numbers when you plug in your exponential uh, function in, uh, results here. So in this function, they got, a, they got a table going on here where they talk about all the different pieces here. f of x equals 2 of x. That's our function. And when you plug in the different values, and I want to start with the 0 here. Okay, Remember, 2 to the 0 is what we're going to get. Remember, this is our function right here. Anything to the zero power, remember, equals one. So that's where we get the zero, one, that coordinate. And what's going to be the trick here on all these is you want to plug in points. Okay, I'm going to give you some, you know, trends, some, you know, certain uh, point traits about all these graphs. But what matters the most is you plug in some points and you start to get a feel for where these are. And then as time goes on, you're going to plug in a little bit less. You're going to know exactly what to plug in. You're going to see your answers. Here, there's nine different points because it's still important that in any graph, any function that you're trying to graph, you've got to be able to make a table, plug in points, and calculate those y values. So plugging in one, we get two to the first, which is just two. And these, I think, are self-explanatory. As, as you go higher and higher, you're going to get powers of two, two to the fourth, two to the third. It's the negative ones that I want to remind everyone about. When you plug in negative one, remember, that means it's a reciprocal of the base. You take that base of 2, you flip it upside down, that's where we get the 1 half. 2 to the negative 2 is 1 over 2 squared, which is your 1 to the 4th. That's where all these values are coming in. Okay? So now that we have a number of points here, we look at what the graph looks like. So here's the coordinates, all the, all the nine points that we've just found. They're all right here. And you'll see this is what an exponential function is. When you graph it, it goes up exponentially. Okay, You've heard that phrase before. Exponentially, they do rise faster. You know, a normal x squared is going to look something like this. Oops, sorry. y equals x squared is going to look something like this. If I can get that right, sorry. Okay, so this side is similar to a regular y square, but you'll find 
as you go further out, <clears throat> the exponential graph goes up really fast. That's why you hear the expression exponential growth. It's just talking about how fast it goes up. So the square function or a cube function may be higher in the beginning, but the exponential function will overtake. <clears throat> so looking at our graph here, and then remember <clears throat> with all those coordinates, let me go back and show you our table here, right here. All these points, remember these fractions on the left, on the top, these are all getting closer and closer to zero, but we never quite get to zero. If you recall, the range is always going to be all positive real numbers, everything above zero. We never get, quite get to zero, so zero, this axis is pretty much a horizontal asymptote. Okay, we never get to zero. You get really close, but you don't ever quite get there. So what I like to tell people is when you draw an exponential function, first identify it's exponential because the x is in the power, and when you draw that, one side I call the flat side, where it's hitting uh, an asymptote, a horizontal asymptote. The other side, on the other hand, this is the exponential, and this is what I call the extreme side. You can read that, extreme. So these are always the two halves. So when you graph it, you plot these points. Remember, it's not like a parabola where they both go up. It's not like the other graphs we did, the uh, rational functions, where they both hit the asymptote. One half hits the asymptote or goes toward the asymptote, the horizontal asymptote right here. And the other side is going to go very high. Now, it's not always left and right. You may get a graph that looks like this. You may get one that looks like this or like this. Just remember, one part is going to go up or down very fast. That's this extreme part. And then once you identify the extreme part, the other part has to be the flat part. So you need to make sure you identify what is the horizontal asymptote. It needs to be clear that this graph just doesn't come down like this. It has to have a clear stopping point, a, a limit. So make sure you identify one side has a horizontal asymptote, the other side is going to go high and high, higher and higher. So they kind of mentioned that here in this last bullet point where it levels off and the other one increases. But like I said, you're going to see exponential graphs that go down or, or reverse or any of those things. Okay, so um, now we have a, an exponential function. It's close, but notice it's a negative x in the power. It's still an exponential. But essentially, everything is going to get reversed on the x's, kind of like those flipping around mirror image problems we had a couple of days ago. In this case, here's all the points, so they're close, but this is one of those cases I was telling you where, okay, if you look at this one, there's still going to be an extreme part. And you know that because you, it only takes a few points, and you're going way up or way down. So we identify that, and then here's that flat part over there. So it still is an exponential function, it's just reverse the other way. Okay, so basic properties. And we'll go through these, just kind of things I've, I've kind of talked about here. You have that, and this junction point, it's not a vertex, but it's an important point, zero, one. I always say, look for the zero, get the one. That's usually the main point, and then you can build both directions. Find out which side is extreme, which side is going to be um, uh, the flat part. So continuous curves, no holes, no jumps. Remember, continuous means it's all connected, and there's no gaps, nothing on. You can do this with one stroke of your pencil. You have a horizontal asymptote, and then, depending on the B, now, this is where I don't really care for these functions, but you can, or these uh, properties, but you can look at them. As that base is greater than 1, it's going to increase as X increases. It goes up to the right. That's also assuming that your X is a positive up there. You know, your power doesn't have a negative in front of it. So... Got a couple things here. Um, let me go back next here to these other things that will matter to you a little bit more. These are reminders of properties you've had before with exponents. When you multiply two things with the same base, your answer is the same base and you add the exponents. When you divide them, same base, but you subtract the exponents. This case down here, remember, this is when you have a power to a power. There, it's not an a times an a, it's a power to a power. This is when you multiply the exponents. And then, of course, some other properties where you distribute the x. 
things you've had before, but this is sort of a reminder or a little refresher of what you had because this is going to help you simplify some of yours. Now, and it's going to come help when you were going to solve these exponential functions, solve other equations. So now you have another property. This is an important one where if you have two things equal to each other where they have the same base, that's important, you can essentially cancel off the base and you can make the two letters, the two powers equal to each other and then you can solve away. And this works the other way where if you have two things equal, you can, if they have the same exponent in this case, same exponent, oh, sorry, let me write this, those are the same, you can basically say the exponent's irrelevant, then the bases have to be the same. So these are both ways to simplify exponentials depending on what's the same. <clears throat> okay, so a couple more things here. Now we get to one of my favorite letters, the E. Now, so we're clear, E is a constant. Kind of like how pi is always 3.14, E is always going to be, it's approximately 2.7, okay? It goes on like pi, it goes on forever, but for our purposes, it's about 2.7. What this is, is this is known as the natural number, where everything involving nature, I'll be honest with you, and population growth, anything like that, <clears throat> it always comes back to this E. It's this perfect number that seems to fit everything that we have in nature, okay? So you'll see it, you know, some examples in a little bit, but this is the main number that everything revolves around, kind of like how pi involves circles, E involves a lot of our natural examples. So what's going to happen is, you in your calculator, you're going to see a button that looks like this, e to the x. So depending on the calculator you have, if I want to get e to the first, okay, we know it's going to be this 2.7, some calculators you push the 1, then you push this button, and it will show you the 2.7. Whereas some other calculators, you have to push the ex button, then you push the 1, then you push an equals, and then it's going to show you the 2.7. And this is important because depending on the type of scientific calculator you might have, you've got to know which way to enter them because it's easy to do it for something you know. But if I say, let's go find x, yeah, sorry, e square on my calculator, I have to be able to punch this up. So let me show you my calculator right quick and see what I'm talking about here. So on mine, if I want to find e to the first, I push the 1. Then I push this EX button right here, and it immediately shows me the 2.7. And you see, this is what it is. It sort of repeats in the beginning, and then it goes on just random numbers throughout the rest of time here. And it is a forever type of problem, just like pi. So if I want to find E square, I push the 2, I push the E to the X, and there's my 7.389. Remember, that's essentially just like taking 2.7 and squaring that, but this is the instant way to get any power of E. Okay, so going back to this slide here, kind of see the, the next couple slides. Okay, so calculators are going to have this e to the x button, and they're going to have this 10 to the x button, because we're going to be dealing with 10 to some power. And it's the same thing. If I want to know 10 square, I know 10 square is 100, but I can push that button 2, and then that button, and it'll show me the answer. And this is important because... Most of the time, we're not going to be entering nice whole numbers. We're going to have decimal bases. Lots of weird decimal bases when we're doing these. Okay, so jumping forward here. Now, this is an interesting one here. The base E can be approximated by this. Good news is you don't have to worry about that one. What I want to know is, can we figure out how this E works? Okay, so I'm going to skip forward here. We have this 2.7, like I said, but I want to make sure we can graph this. We can deal with these two functions right here. So we have y equals e to the x and y equals e to the negative x. Now, first off, it's the same thing. The domain is going to be all real numbers. As you see right here, the range is going to be everything above zero. If you were to take a graph, and this is what I'm, I'm going to tell everybody, you can memorize these pictures, but it's good to be able to come up with the picture if needed. Here's the x, here's the y equals e to the x. So if I try just my normal numbers and plot those, now remember, plug in z, sorry, 0, 
e to the 0, everything, everything to the 0 is always going to be 1. So that holds true just like other exponential graphs that we've done already. e to the 1st is that 2.7. E, e to the 2nd is like a 7.8-ish. Okay. Now e to the negative 1, I don't know if I can do this. Okay, yeah, you can see that. So e to the negative 1, I punch in negative 1, which is a 1, and hit that plus minus button, and I still hit that e to the x button, and you see it's a small decimal. Remember we were getting 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth when it was 2 to the x? So this is going to be point, I'll just call it point 0.4. And then the negative 2, clear it out, 2 negative e to the e to that is a 1.3, we'll call it 1.4. 0.14, I'm sorry. So you can kind of get the idea. As we go higher here, this is going to definitely get bigger and bigger. This one is approaching zero. It never hits zero. Remember, that's an asymptote, but it approaches it. So if you look at my next slide here, these are the graphs that we get. Okay, so just started. The one we just figured out is this one right here. Like I said, as you go to the left, as the, the x value gets lower and lower, this thing is approaching zero. There's my asymptote. As I go to the right, it's getting extreme. That's going to be the, you know, high. That's going to be the extreme side right here. Okay, and then, of course, e to the negative x is just a flipped over version. But it's, notice, they are exponential functions. Okay, whether it's 2 to the x, 5 to the x, 3 to the x, or e to the x, they're all exponential functions, so you're going to get the same uh, traits of an extreme side and some flat tapering side like you see right here. Okay, so that's your functions for e to the x. They're still exponentials. And the e to the x is the one, you might have caught that on a slide earlier, that's the most common base used in our applications, like I said, because of the natural idea here. Okay. So now we talk about other things that are going to happen. If you put a number in front of the e to the x, e to the t function, it's going to affect it. If it's a constant, it's going to affect it by basically sliding it, not sliding it, but stretching it upward. If you put a number times the, the power, it's going to affect it by sort of stretching it to the right and the left. Okay, But like I said earlier, population growth, radioactive decay, they use these. So... They talk about this relative growth rate. Okay, so I'm not going to bombard you right now. I'm going to let you, oh, let's wait till they get to the examples here. But when you have a function like this, you're going to have growth, population, or radioactive decay. It's going to be a negative number. That constant right there, that's what sort of dictates how fast something grows or how fast something decays. So they call it the relative growth rate. But it's the main trait of any kind of a growth factor. All right, so talk about, now we have this growth of a bacteria. Good example here. So we have this function. Now these functions look kind of crazy in the beginning, but if you stop to realize them, they're not as bad. We have n equals n naught is what that little zero, n sub zero is. And that n sub zero they talk about, it's the initial amount. It's the start. So most of these are going to be the same but different variables. This is what you start with. The initial amount. That's usually what that little sub-zero is standing for. It's the initial amount, the starting amount. Okay? So it's a bacteria. And I realize we're in a business type class, but the bacteria won't be something you guys deal with, but it's going to have the same sort of prop, um, what do you call it, uh, you know, ideas of, of money growth and population growth. So this is what you start with. And then this E right here, this is the formula that tells you how much you grow. So as time goes on, remember, E is a constant number, 2.7. That 1.386, that's a constant number. The only variable going on, if you know how much you start with, the variable is this T. And T, as you see, is time. It's always going to be time. In this case, it's the number of hours. So if you take a certain amount that you know you start with and you plug it in here, and then you plug in how many hours you're going to run this experiment for in place of t, and you calculate this, this will tell you how much you end with. So the t sub 0 is how much you start with. The oh, Sorry, the n sub 0 is how much you start with. The n is what you end with. And this is how you get there. Now what you're going to realize is 
It's going to be the same formula for banking, for population. Sometimes they're going to ask you exactly that. You start with a certain amount and you go for this long, how much do you end with? And then other times they're going to say, we start with this and we want to end with this, how long will it take? So there's different things we're going to solve for. So in our example, they say there are 25 bacteria in the start, how much will be there in 0.8 hours? And then the second question, how much will be there in point or 2.5 hours? So going back to the formula, notice they told us we start with 25, so that's why we immediately replace that n sub 0 with the 25 right here. Okay, so the new formula becomes this. We took the original formula, we replace it with 25. Now, we plug in the time right there. So t is 0.8, we put it in there, and now the big question, how in the world did they get to 76? And that's what I want to show you. So, give me one second. Go back. Okay, trying to pull my calculator up, but it's not letting me. Give me one second. Okay, so, I still lost it. Sorry, let's just do it right here. You can see enough, I hope. Now, what we need to plug in here, we're talking about E to the 1.386 times the 0.8, take that as your e power, then you got to multiply it by 25. So the sequence in your calculator is going to be a little backwards. First, I do the 1.386. Then I multiply that by the 0.8, and this gives me the new power. So they didn't write that, but it's kind of like this. n equals 25e to the 1.1088. Now, this is on my calculator. I don't. That's why they didn't have to write this. I just hit this EX button. Remember, whatever's on your screen, when you hit the E to the X, it's going to tell you the power of E to that power. So I hit that. Now this whole right side, E to the 1.1, is going to be 3.03. .03. I multiply that by the 25. So we sort of work from right to left. We work backwards here. But this is how we get the 75.76, and they rounded it up to 76. So that's how they got this answer. In the second problem, it's the same thing. We have a t of 2.5. I take that 1.386, multiply it by 2.5 hours, and now this is on my screen. I take and multiply or find that to the e power, which is now 31.9, multiply that by the 25, and we get 799. So you see how fast this thing grows in two and a half hours. It's gone from 25 all the way up to almost 800. That's how fast it grows. It's a very fast growing bacteria. Okay? So that's what's going on here. How, you, how are you going to plug that stuff in when you get to these different functions? Okay. So now the rest of this, okay, a couple of things here. This is the, the, uh, equ the graph of this, by the way. So if you were to plot 0.2, which would be right around here, we had a low number. Then you plot that two and a half, which is right around here. We had that almost 800. And it looks like we're going up by thousands. And you see, this is how fast this bacteria grows. In five hours, we're over 10,000. That's how quick it goes from just the initial amount of 25. But the graph is exactly the same. If you want to graph this, there's going to be a flat side and an extreme side. Start plugging in values to a table and replace T with all these numbers and you'll get a few more points to see what this picture looks like. Now we have exponential decay, where it's exactly the same thing as we had before, but it's going backwards. So, you know, you kind of give the, the heads up here what's going on. You have this radioactive carbon, and as time goes on, it actually loses mass. It loses its, its amount that's in there. Over time, it just gets smaller and smaller. It never quite disappears, but based on its size, it loses a certain amount. That's what's going on with the decay. So we got this. Here's the formula. Now, notice it's a similar formula last time. They had a capital N and an N sub zero. Well, this is A and A sub zero, but it's the same idea. A sub zero, A naught, is what you begin with. You run the T, which is your time. You plug that in here, and the capital A is going to tell you how much you end with. So your starting amount and your final amount. Notice 
this exponent has a negative number in front of it. That's what's happening when we're doing decaying. It's going to get smaller and smaller. So when time is zero, that's how much in the very beginning, that's when you start this experiment, that's what a sub naught is. That's how much you have. In fact, if you plug in a zero here, notice zero times this becomes zero. e to the zero is one. That's why a sub zero is what you begin with. That is your initial amount. Okay, so we have 500 milligrams of this carbon-14, and this is how they do carbon dating, by the way. They can go back and see how, how far it is. How many milligrams will be present in 15,000 years? So we round the result to two decimal places. So this is your time, this is your starting amount, and we're gonna plug these in. So remember, starting amount, 500, we put it in right here. Then we're going to take this 15,000, we're going to put it here into this one, and you see, they plug in the 15,000. And to get this on a calculator, you take the 15,000, you multiply it by 0 0.000124, make sure you hit the negative, hit the equals, and whatever that answer is on your screen, you then you hit the E button, then you multiply that by the 500. So it's exactly like the last problem, and you see we have 77.84 milligrams. So in 15,000 years, it went from 500 milligrams down to 77. It'll never get to zero, but as we move on more and more, it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller, the amount that you have of this carbon. Okay, now half-life. You might have heard of this. It's the same concept, but a half-life is what they talk about. Um, how long does it take a decaying element to get to its halfway points? Okay, now this is... It's a constant degradation, you know, it's slowly going away. But the question is, at any one point, if you pause time and you measure how much carbon's in there, and then you start the clock, and then you wait for it to get exactly half of what you just have, how long is that gonna take? That's what's known as the half-life. Okay, so in this graph, this is what the, oops, sorry, go back. This is the function, what it looks like. Remember, it's a backwards one because of the negative. As time goes on, it's gonna get less and less. Never gets to zero, but it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So use this graph to estimate the half-life of it. Well, here's how we look at it. Pick any point you want. It doesn't matter. Any point on the graph. So if I was to pick this 500, we want to know how long does it take, take to get halfway. Well, now i got to find out where 250 is. 250 looks right around here. So the question is, how long here has passed? That's the question about the half-life. Okay, so if you look at this graph, this looks like it's going by 10,000. Oops, sorry. Each hash mark is like 10,000. So here's 10,000, here's 20,000, 30, 40, and up to 50. So it looks like this is about halfway of 10,000. It looks like it's about 5,000 years. Now, this is an estimate because I'm looking at the graph, but that's my quick estimate. Now, I'll show you another way how this works. You can pick any point. I picked the initial, but let's say I picked the 400 right here. Okay, so this 400, I want to know how long does it take, take to get the halfway point of there. That's 200 right there, and the question still comes out to be how far is this right here, this amount of time, and notice, it's the same thing. It's about 5,000. Okay, Any two points, you can go and estimate the half-life, or you'll see in a second, we can use the formula and exactly measure it. You know, If I wanted to go from 200 down to 100, right here, how far is that distance? That's, again, about 5,000. Okay, It doesn't matter where you're talking about. Um, it's going to keep going that way. My last one that might, I don't know if it's going to make it easier or worse, if I go from 100 to 50, notice again, that's about 500 right there. Okay, so that's how, or 5,000, I'm sorry. So that's how we know how much, the what the half-life is, how long it takes at any point in time, how long does it take to get half of what you originally had. Okay, so they're going to do this, and you see they draw a horizontal line at 250. Okay. That's half of the 500. They didn't draw it right here. So you look at where this hits, you look at where this hits, and you see 
they got it at about 6,000. Now, again, they're kind of nitpicking right there. We're going to get the exact figure in a second by using the equation. This is just an estimate on the graph. So now, you can find it with a calculator. We'll get to that as well right here. So notice, pick any two amounts, the initial starting amount, and then we want to go half of it. This is always half right here is the key. So pick a value, any value, pick half of it. So I could have picked 200 and 100. I could have picked 400 and 200. As long as the starting amount is something and the ending amount is half. Now you see, we're going to try to solve for t. All right, so watch what happens. They're going to use the graphing calculator on this one. So it's not as, I, it's precise, but it's not, it's not going to use the calculus, the algebra here is what I'm saying. So when they plug this in here, they plug in the 250 to 500, and you get the graph. I'll show it right here. Then you're going to put your, your cursor right on that 250, and then you see the actual intersection, x, and you see the difference is 5589. That's, that's the actual half-life. So remember, I was looking at about 5,000. This Whoever wrote the slide thought it was about 6,000. It's right in the middle. 5,500 is what the half-life is. Okay? So rounding it up to the nearest whole number, we get that, and that's what we have. Okay, so other ones, we're going to have some regression. I'm going to skip over these just to, you know, you can look at these and see what's going on, but it's the same idea kind of showing, in this case, how many people are using a certain item, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or some social media, or going down over time. You know, people use it or they start using it less, but everything's going to have this exponential feel to it. So... I want to jump out of here though because I want to focus most of the time today on some problems. Okay, so here's homework two. Hopefully you're fairly uh, far through this. Let me pick up where we left off last time, this number 59 problem. Okay, so in this case, they want you to match, and let me make this a little bit bigger so we can see. Hopefully that helps you all. Okay, match each equation with the graph of F, G, H, or K. All right, so we have a bunch of graphs right here, and we have to match each one. So the graph for Y equals 7X. Let me see, pull this up a little bit. Y equals 7 to the X. Now, if, you're, if you remember what I was telling you, there's going to be an extreme side for an exponential, and there's going to be a, a flat side. Now, there are four different graphs here, and we're trying to figure out which one is fitting with what we have. So my simple answer I'm going to tell you is go plot a few points, easy ones at first. When you plug in 0, you get 1. When you plug in 1, you get 7. When you plug in negative 1, you get 1 7. When you plug in 2, you get 49. That gives you an idea of these points of what's happening. So what I want you to see is as x goes to the right, this graph is going to shoot upward. As x goes to the left, it's going to get close to 0. So we just have to figure out which one it is. Now, looking at what we have, it's definitely not going to be k or f because those are going the opposite way. All right? It's going to be one of these, this G or this H. And looking at it, i got to tell you, it's not 100% clear. They're almost the same. So that's why I'm going to go back to my original picture. See this one right here, this A and C? Both of these have similar traits. Now, if I look at the other one right next to it, the 11X problem, you see what we get here. 0, 1, 2. We get a 1. We get an 11. We get a 121. And we get a negative 111. What I want to focus on is these particular points. See how this graph, it's higher. And over here at 2, it's also a lot higher. So that tells me this one on the right, because you have a bigger base, it's climbing a lot faster. So of these two, it can't tell by much. And I'll zoom in a little bit more. This reddish one, this... G, I believe, yeah, is climbing a lot faster. This is going to be the one that has the 11x. And this one right here is going to be my 7x. But you see, they're almost the same picture. Small differences in what you have there. Just very small, especially when you look at it 
from far away, but that's what we have there. So it appears that H is going to be the graph that we have for right here, and I think that's how, oh, I think we got to plug in. Yeah, I believe that's what I'm trying to plug in. Yep, there's my H, and that one works. So I'll get back. I'm just going to remember, remind myself that G is going to be this one right here. Okay, so that's how we, we compare them. Now, it's going to be the same thing for these other two right here. When we look at those, it's going to be a slight difference, but they're, they're going to be similar. When you have a number, a base less than 1, it has the same effect as putting a negative in front of the power where it reverses it around, okay, because of the idea of how the powers work. So I'll do the same thing and just kind of look at the 1 eighth. Okay, when I graph 1 eighth right here, oh, sorry, not 1 eighth, x, and... 1 eighth to the x. So notice a trend. When you plug in 0, you still get a 1. When I plug in 1, I get 1 eighth. When I plug in 2, I get 1 64th. Now the weird one is when I plug in a negative 1, it flips over. I'm back to 8. Negative 2 gets me to be a 64. So that's why you see this graph. As it goes to the right, it gets flat, like one of those. And as it goes to the left, it's going upward. Now, just like before, while I have this up, I'm going to look at the other one that has the same effect. When the base is less than 1, this is the kind of graph you're going to get. So at 0, it's 1. 1, it's at 0. 0.7. 2, it's going to be at 0. 0.49. And then over here at negative 1, it's going to be 1 over 0. 0.7. Now, it's kind of hard to compare all these. You know, left to right, we were able to compare them last time, but let me get my calculator out here. And you can see what I'm talking about. If you take 1 divided by 0.7, you get a 1.42. Okay. If you take 1 eighth from our first graph, just to compare it with decimals, you get 0.125. When I get the negative 2, it's 1 over 0.7 squared. And that's going to be 2.04. So here's what I want you to see. Both functions, as you go to the left, they're going to go upward. This one right here is going up a lot faster. Look at the numbers. Negative 1, 8. Negative 1, 1 1.42. Negative 2, 64. Negative 2, ne uh, positive 2.04. This one's going up. It's just not going up as fast as the 1 eighth equation. So when I look at my graphs, I can see that this f function is the one that's going up really fast. This is going to be the 1 eighth x function. <coughs> the one other one that's going up, the k, it's not going up as fast, but it's still going upward. This is going to be the 0.7x. That we're looking at okay so when I select my answer for 0.7 it's the one that's not going up as fast that's going to be my K okay now we've kind of already got the other ones but remember remember this is going to be G and then the last one that's left looks like it's going to be F there's our answers okay so that's you know how it works you you know like i said you can see they're all exponential functions but my recommendation is just plot a few points and it'll narrow it down and you'll start to see if you've got two like the g and the h that are really close look for the ones that are close like these two a and c and see which one's going up faster which one's going up slower and that's how you can make a determination of which is the actual answer okay so again i'm just going to kind of skip around counting by fours here of what we have. So on this one, graph the function y equals negative e to the negative x over the interval zero, sorry, negative three to positive three. So what that means is when I'm graphing this, this graph has all real numbers as a domain, but instead of me worrying about that, I really only have to look at these right here. 
okay? And I don't need to graph all seven of them. I just want to graph a few to make sure I've got this down. Now, I always go with my zero because that's the one. And then remember, e to the first, oops, sorry. Now it's going to be a little different. There's a couple negatives in there. So when you plug in a one, remember how this works. When x equals one, So x equals 1, we have to plug it into that equation right there. So we get x equals 1. So that means y equals negative e to the negative 1. We have to figure out what all that is. Now, don't try to overthink this. Use your calculator. So I start with plugging in the power of negative 1. So remember, that's a 1 and hit that plus minus button. You see a negative 1 there, now hit the e button. This is e to the negative 1, and don't forget, there's a negative in front of it. So it's negative 0.4. Okay, now go the other way. Let's plug in negative 1. That means we have y equals negative e to the negative negative 1. So that means e to the first. e to the first gives me that. Then put a negative in front of it, we get a negative 2.7. Now I'll do one more, let's do the three. And I'll do the negative three also, why not? Y equals negative e to the negative three. So just be careful when you use your calculator. Negative three, e, make it a negative. It's negative 0 0.05, very small. Okay, over on the y, x equals negative 3, we get y equals negative e to the negative negative 3. So that's e to the positive 3. And you'll get the hang of it as you do this more and more. There's e to the third, gives me a 20. Stick a negative in front of it, we get a negative 20. So real quick, if I just sketch this, at negative 3, I'm all the way down here at negative 20. At negative 1, I'm at negative 2. <clears throat> that may be a little bit higher. Let me put it right there. At 0, we're at 1. Oh, and I did that wrong. Now I know I did wrong. Sorry. That's supposed to be a negative 1, everyone, because there's a negative in front right there. <clears throat> that helps. So let me get rid of that. Okay. So it's supposed to be negative 1. We would have seen the graph would have looked funny if I didn't do that. And then everything's getting closer and closer. So our graph looks something like that. And remember, though, it stops at positive 3 and it stops at negative 3. <clears throat> so now we look at all of our pictures, and you can eyeball them. And you can see we probably did more work than we had to. But it isn't this one. It isn't this one. Probably this one and not that one. That's my only choice. And there's our answer. Okay, so take a look at that, and like always, pause if you need to look at this any more in depth. And let's jump to some other ones here. Okay, number 67, graph this function. Now again, they give you an interval, and you see you get the hang of it, it's gonna be using our calculator, and you don't have to graph every single point. Just graph enough to see what's the picture, what it's going to look like. So no lower than negative 4, no higher than 2, so I'm just going to go 0, 1, see what I get. Okay, now, as you get better at these, you're going to do some of these in your head, but I'm not going to do that right now. Plug it in 0. We get y equals negative 3 plus e to the 1 plus 0. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's e to the first. Okay, 1 plus 0, so use your calculator. e to the first is that. And now you subtract 3 from it, we're at negative 0.28. And I'll call it negative 3. Let me plug in the negative 4. We get y equals negative 3 plus e to the 1 minus 4. So that's plus e to the negative 3. 
That's what we're trying to find out there. Now notice it's not a negative 3 times the value. Like our last problem, we were multiplying the e times something. This is plus. We're adding two terms here. So first off, I always start with the more complicated. Let's get negative 3. e to the negative 3 is this. That's a positive. I'm adding it to a negative 3, so it's like I'm subtracting it from th 3 from it. And we get a negative 2.9. Okay, now we'll go with a 1. y equals negative 3 e to the 1. Sorry, fix that. I just got done telling you not to do that. It's positive, positive e to the 1 plus 1. So we have e to the second. Subtract 3 from that, and we get a 4.4. .4. Then last one, we get the 2. Y equals negative 3 plus e to the 1 plus 2. So that's e to the third. e to the third is 20. Subtract 3 from that, and we get 17. Now remember what I said. There's two sides of every exponential function. One side's going to go very extreme, high or low. One side's going to go flat. It's easier to find the extreme side. So look at what the, we have on our table. We have four points right here. If you don't know which one's the extreme side, then you need to get some more points. But I can see right here, this thing's getting pretty quick. That's my extreme side. Therefore, this side has to be my flat side. There's no other choice. Okay, so we have 0 and negative 0.3. We have 1 and 4.4. .4. We have 2 and 17. You can see from the picture, yeah, that's my extreme part. And then over here at negative 4, it's at negative 2.9. So it's starting to flatten out. And my guess is, and I'll give you the trick, whatever this number is by itself, that's going to be your horizontal asymptote. And you see, it's getting closer and closer to negative 3. Now, our graph ends at negative 4, but if you didn't have that domain, if they didn't tell you this right here, you plug in negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, negative 20, you're going to see you're going to get closer and closer to negative 3. That's your horizontal asymptote. So now we look at our pictures. It's definitely not C and D because they're not going the right direction. It could be one of these right here. Now, this one doesn't look like it's going up as fast. This is where you got to see the points. Remember, this point over here is 2, 17. So you look at 2. It looks like it's getting up there. This 2 looks like it's only about 5 or 6. So they're close. And the other thing is, this one is going down to negative 3. This one seems to stop at 0. So it's not B. It's going to be A as our picture. And that's all we got to do. All right, so again, pause if you need to look at this any more in depth. And we'll move on to the next one. Okay, solve the given equation for x. Now, you remember one of those properties that we had here. It said, let me write this equation a little bigger. If you have two things equal to each other that have the same base, right there, same base of 9, you don't need the base anymore, and you just set the two powers equal to each other. Now, you may have forgotten how to do this. Remember, when you're solving a quadratic, you set everything on one side equal to 0. I'm going to move these over to the right just because I want that x to be positive. And then I'm going to factor. And I get x equals 3 or x equals 2. Now, <clears throat> the last part is make sure these answers don't break anything in your domain. Now, I didn't talk about it, but the original problem right here, the domain is all real numbers. I can plug in anything for a power. That's acceptable. Now, if you had a denominator, if you had a root, then we got some exceptions. If we have a, a log, which we're going to get to later, there's exceptions. But here, any number is going to work. So my solutions are 3 and 2. That's all it takes right here. Plug in the 2, comma 3. Remember, they're just listing them separately. And there's our answer.
Okay, so let's check out number 75. Now we have another equation. E to the x, oh, sorry, 8x e to the x plus e to the x equals 0, and they wanted you to note that e to the x cannot be equal to 0. Okay, and the reason why is, if you look at the graph of e to the x, remember it's an exponential, it never hits 0 right here. It gets close, but it never hits 0. That's why e to the x can never be equal to 0. There is no power you could put there into x that'll make it 0. No matter what you plug in there, it's going to get smaller and smaller, but it's never going to hit 0. So they wanted to point out that you can't get that. So how do we do this problem? Well, see if you remember this. When you have it equal to zero, your first job is to factor the whole side. Kind of like that last problem, how we factor the x squared minus 5x plus 6. We have this. We have two terms. So the first rule of factoring is if you have a greatest common factor, let's factor that out. So that's what we have right here. I factored out that e to the x. It's as simple as that. Then you set every factor equal to zero. So I set the e to the x equal to 0, and I set the 8x plus 1 equal to 0, and I solve both of these individually. But if you recall from about a minute ago, they already told us e to the x can't be 0, so there's no solution right there for that one. I don't even bother with that one. If it wasn't that, I would still set, I'd solve each of the pieces, but when you try to solve that, you're not going to get an answer. But I can solve this one on the right. We had 8x equals negative 1, x equals negative one-eighth, and that is my solution right here. Okay, you might have more than one, sometimes like this. You don't, oops, negative one-eighth, and there's our answer for this one. Okay, let's look at number 79. And as you can see, as I'm going through these, a lot of these look like other ones that we've done. They're similar, but let's just make sure, you know, if you need more help, you can always email me and I'll do a specific problem. Okay, so if you look at this one here, they want you to graph the functions. We've kind of done this before, but not exactly because this one is, it's got an extra piece involved. So h of x equals x times 3 to the x. Now, they do tell us we have an interval between negative 3 and 0. As you get more advanced with these, you're going to realize I can't just use whole numbers. I'm going to have to start using decimals. But for now, let's just I always like to start my table with the whole numbers that I can. And then we'll, then we'll get more if we need. So we get x, and we get this function. And I like to write the function here just so we know what we're getting. So can't go any lower than negative 3, can't go any higher than 0. We might as well at least plug in the two whole numbers in between. If we need to get some more fractions, we'll get them. Okay, so I'll start with a 0. h of 0 equals 0 times 3 to the 0. Well, don't forget, 3 to the 0 is 1. It doesn't matter because you get a 0. Okay, h of 1, sorry, negative 1. We get negative 1 times 3 to the negative 1. Again, this is where your calculator comes in. Don't be afraid to use this thing. You do not have any extra points for doing these in your head. Make sure you know how to get these. Now, 3 to the negative 1, I don't need a calculator, I'm sorry, on this one, the next one I, uh, I'll, I'll work on them. This is just 1 third, I'm looking at something else. So we get a negative 1 third. All we need to do is, sorry. I'm thinking when we do a decimal exponent, then we got to deal with it. So negative one third. H of two, we get negative two. Sorry, negative two is what I'm plugging in. H of negative two, we get negative two times three to the negative two. So this means one over three squared, which is one ninth. So we get a negative two over nine. Last one, negative 3, we get negative 3 times 3 to the negative 3. That means negative 3 times 1 over 27. So that's negative 1 ninth, it looks like. All right, so now we plot these. So 
So it looks like we get 0, 0, negative 1, negative 1 third, and then we have our negative 2 and our negative 3. So negative 2 looks like it's going to be at negative 2 ninths, and then negative 1 ninth. So you see it's going upward. Okay, yeah, so we have something that does this, but there's a big mystery of what happens right there in between. Okay, what's going to happen as we get there? Does it jump? Does it curve back? And you see, this is where I'll start looking at some of the pictures here just to see what we have. If I look at this first one a little more in depth, it's got my zero, zero, and it's got some of these. Maybe, maybe not, okay? This one, it does not have my zero, zero, so I'm throwing that out right now. No, no go on B. If I look at C, it also has my zero, zero, and it has those something going on like that. So that may be good. And I, I apologize because I wish there was a little more clarity on these numbers. And you see, there's a negative one there, there's a negative four there. Okay, so we see the numbers. This looks like it's going by one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so last one. Also, we have that zero. So we have to look at some points here, what we have. So we're clear. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a six. This value right here is negative one third. Okay, so if you look at my point, negative one is negative one third. So this matches on this one. Negative one, it looks like it's negative one half. So this is not gonna happen right here. So we can throw out B and C. And this one, we have negative one, also negative one half. So I hope I didn't miss anything. That looks like that's my picture. Now before I go with it, let me pick another point. Negative two, negative two ninths. That looks like we have a little bit less than I wanted it to be. This looks, it doesn't look 100% like I wanted it to be because this looks like it's going to be a third right here. Yeah, and I guess this is the negative two ninths right here when I look at it, and this is the one ninth. Yeah, that makes more sense now. So this looks like it's our graph. Cross my fingers, go with it, and then we're good. Okay, so the trick I'm trying to get you to see is plot points. If you weren't sure, plug in negative one half right here. Like I didn't know that behavior right here. Plug in a negative one half. Plug in a negative one half. Get this on your calculator. See what you get. Go with that right there. Okay? So that's it for this one. Let's look at number 83. Continue our trend of going by four here. Okay, for this one, couple just had a baby. How much should they invest now at a 5.9 compounded daily in order to have 35,000 for a child's education 18 years from now? Compute your the answer to the nearest dollar. Now I skipped this in the PowerPoint, so I'm gonna pull that back up real quick just to give you a quick rundown on the money part. Okay, so this is what we have here. Compound interest, all right? If you ever have a bank account or a credit card or anything that has interest in it, you see compound is when you get interest on interest. Like every certain, there's a term, whether it's monthly or quarterly or yearly or daily, the bank will put interest in based on your balance and that adds to your balance. And then they calculate it again each time and then since you've earned interest, you have more in there and you're going to get a little extra. It's going to get more and more and more. So here is our formula right here, this compound interest problem. All right, where we have um, A, P, this one plus R over M, M, T. Now here's the fun part. You got a complicated formula. The formula is no good unless you understand what every letter stands for. So I'll start with the P. P is the principal, the present value, or the starting value, just like that N naught, the A naught, the A sub zero that we did earlier with the, the compound growth and decay. This front coefficient, this number is always what you start with 
and the number on this side is always what you end with. Then you apply this process right here. Okay, now the tricky part is you have to know R, and they tell you R is the annual rate, the annual percentage rate, you know, the APR that you might hear. The important thing is it's got to be a decimal. Okay, so it's a decimal. Then we have to divide it by how M, which is how many times a year you get interest. So if you're getting interest every month, then you divide this by 12 because that's how many times a year you get it. If you're doing interest quarterly, then you divide by M, which is 4. If you're doing it daily, which is kind of weird, but it could happen, you divide it by 365. It's how many times a year you get interest. So you take that percentage rate, which is a decimal. Now, before I go any further, remember a decimal, you know, decimals, but if they tell you your annual percentage rate or your R is 4.6, that's kind of nice, but let's just pretend that that's what it was. The decimal of that is 0 0.046. Just remember, you don't just drop the percent sign. You've got to divide it by 100. So go on your calculator. Take 4.6, divide it by 100. That decimal, that is what your R is going to be. That's what you plug in right down here. Okay? Then you have the M, which is, again, that same M as before. How many times a year do you do interest? 12 times. Monthly, do a 12. Quarterly, do a 4. Yearly, do a 1. That is how many times. They're the same number. And then T is how many years you have. And I think I saw it somewhere in here. Yeah, T years. So you have a lot of variables, but this is the formula that we're going to use to get this. So I'm going to leave it kind of on the side of the screen because we're going to use this and I want to make sure you're all seeing what we have here, what we use for this problem. So let's try this. Okay, I got it kind of sneaking in the bottom right there. That's our formula. So the question, they, they have a lot of information here and they tell you some things. So here's my formula. A is your future. P is the initial, the start. How about that? R is your rate. And again, I'm going to say in decimals, M is the number of times per year. And T is the number of years. Now we have to identify in this problem what is what. So starting off, 5.9%. So don't say 5.9. Rather, R equals 0 0.059. That's your R. Okay? Now they tell you this is a it's kind of hidden there compounded daily, that's telling you the compounding is how often the interest is done. So it's every day. So that means our M right here is going to be 365 times per year. Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, what about a leap year? Let's just go with regular years for now and say 365. If you want to get real technical, you can do 365.25. Okay. And this is one that I'm going to learn. Depends on the books. Some books will do it 365 by default. Some will do 365.25. I'm just trying to see if there was an example where they did that. Yeah, they didn't really talk about it, but let's just say 365. If we get it wrong, we know what to fix. Okay. So, oh yeah, they actually said it right here. I'm sorry. That's what I was looking for. Assume a 365 day year. So that's why M is 365. They tell you the years is 18 and they have 35, how much should they invest? So what they want is they want to end with $35,000. They're estimating it's going to take thirty-five grand for the child's education. So the question they know is we're going to do this for 18 years. We're going to have a certain amount of money. This is the mystery. This is what we don't know. Okay, so they want to figure out what we start with. So if you look at my formula, 35,000 equals P, our unknown, times 1 plus 0 
zero five nine over three sixty five and on top we have three sixty five times eighteen okay our goal is to solve for p so how do we do this well kind of break this down here I'm gonna figure out all of this here okay now it's not gonna be easy but I'm gonna figure out the two pieces individually let's figure out inside the parentheses now I'll tell you when you're dealing with money especially if it's a large amount of money and it's going for a long time you want to try not to round anything if you can try to go as as precise as possible. So I have the 0 0.059 divided by 365. And you're getting this decimal that goes on forever. We're going to add 1 to that. Okay? So I'm going to move this down here. Okay? That's a lot. I know you don't have to write that much, but we'll come back to that. I'll show you how we're going to do this. We have the 365 times 18. That comes out a little bit nicer. Okay, so now let's go back, and there is another button on your calculator that I'm going to show you. This button right here, this YX right there, if you take any power any base to any power. Like if I want to find 3 squared, we all know 3 squared is 9, but I can take that button. I hit the base. I hit that x to the y. I hit the power of 2, and I hit equals, and you're going to see I'm going to get a 9. So like I said, I always like to try the button out with something we know. Hit the 3, hit the button, hit the power, hit the equals, and there's your 9. Okay? If you want to try something more in depth, like 2 to the 5th is 32, 2, hit the button, hit the power, and there's your 32. So we want to do that same thing up here with this big number. Now, I don't want to type the whole thing in here, so I'm going to do this one more time. I'm going to, this 6570 is not rounded. It's a perfect number. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to recalculate on my calculator this 0.059 divided by 365 equals this. Add the 1 to it. So this is the number inside the parentheses, and notice it goes on forever, even though my calculator only shows like 15 digits. That's forever. Now I, that's my base. I hit that, and I bring it to the 6570, and I get All right, so now how do we solve that? Let me get rid of this other stuff that I wrote. So remember algebra. How do I solve for the P? I divide both sides by this 2.89. Now remember, P is or this this number this is a forever decimal, it's already on my screen. So 35,000 divided by this, if it's already in the screen, another shortcut is, now you can just redo this, but again, I want to get as many decimals as I can. So a trick is, there's this button right here, this 1 over x. It basically takes the 289 and it flips it down to the bottom. Maybe. And then I multiply that by the 35,000. And there's my precise answer right there. And now we can round it. At the very end is when you can round it. And I'll round to the nearest penny. I think they told us to round to the nearest dollar. So we'll call it 12,103. So that's how much you need to invest. If you had this kind of an account and you invest, that's what you're going to get. That's how much you'll get after 18 years at that rate. So this is what this interest problem is going to tell you how you're going to be able to figure out what the answer is. Sometimes they're going to say, if you invest this much, how much will you end with? Then you're solving for this A over here. In this case, they wanted us to solve for P, so we had to kind of work backwards a little bit. Okay, so let's do one more of these. Okay. Here's the population here. I think this is the last problem here. Population of some state in 2010 
was 33 million and its annual percentage rate of continuous growth is R equals 1.09. Write the formula and they give you the formula right here. They want you to write this where R is in decimal notation and models the population in millions of years after 2010. Okay, so this equation right here, let me just tell you how it works. This is also in the slides, it's in your book. So as you can guess, kind of like the last problem, this is the end amount, this is the start amount. The E is always E, this is the growth rate, and again, I'll, I'll say it, it's supposed to be in a decimal, so you have to convert that percent. And this is the number of years, or time. Okay, so, 33 million and R equals 1.09, so remember this is 0 0.0109, is that R, okay? Now everything's in the millions, so we're gonna write 33 for the P, and that means 33 million. And then years, and that's the important part, that's years after 2010, so it's like you treat 2010 like it's year zero. Twenty eleven x equals one, twenty twenty x equals ten, and so forth. It's how many years passed. Okay, so to do my formula, I'm going to replace all these items here, and you get the thirty three in the front. You get e to the power of zero point zero one zero nine x. I think that's what they wanted. Yeah, X is that. And there's our formula right there. Now we're going to use this formula. <coughs> Excuse me. F of X equals 33E to the 0 0.0109X. Now we want to find out what happens is the population in 2022. Now here's the key. <coughs> Excuse me. Don't plug in 2022 because that's going to give a huge power to X. You got to think back over here on the bottom right, 2022 means x equals 12. That's what I need to plug in right there. So 33e to the point 0 0.0109 times 12. And you should be able to do this in one motion of your calculator. So the trick here on the homework, you really got to learn and get comfortable with your calculator so that when the test comes around, you're not fumbling and stumbling and trying to deal with it and figure out as you go. Get comfortable. You're going to make mistakes, but you'll figure out how it works. So I start with the power. 0 0.0109 times 12. There is my power of E. So I, while that's on the screen, I hit the E button right there. Now multiply that by 33, and we get 37.6114. They want you to round to the nearest whole number. So I'm going to say 38 million. And there's our answer. Okay, so there's some homework problems. We've kind of done a good chunk of them. We've done essentially a fourth of them and then some. So you should be good to go on homework number two. Don't forget the quiz is due on Monday evening like always. And then over the weekend, I'll start uh, recording videos for the third week and you'll get a couple more just like these. So if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Have a good weekend. Have a good time with the quiz and let me know.